met yet. My name is Justin. I get the privilege of being the student director here. Super glad y'all are here. Welcome. Who's had a fabulous February 1st? Nice. Who pronounces both R's in February? Like, you're like, February. Some of you just realized that there are, in fact, two R's in February. All right, all right. Um, Coach James, do you mind giving me just a little bit of light up here? I feel a little, like, darkness. Light. There we go, there we go. I like, that's right, in the light we find healing, so. Um, golly. All right, so this evening, tonight, we're starting a brand new series called Pursuing Purity. And if you didn't pick up on it in the bumper video, we are talking about relationships. Ooh. How many of you are like, oh, crap. See, I'm just that guy who's super corny. And so, like, in February rolls, Febu February, February, see, even I can't figure it out. Uh, when it comes around, like, Valentine's Day is, like, a big deal, and uh, which reminds me to buy my wife flowers and chocolates and do all the things I'm supposed to do. Yeah, I know. Um, um, no, it's good, it's good. But uh, I get corny, I'm like, alright, that seems like the perfect time to talk about relationships. To dig into, like, this thing that is relationships. So before we get too far into this conversation, I want to I wanna read us a quick passage of scripture um, to kind of help remind us of hope and of the gospel. Because I know that when we talk about relationships, for some of you, it's this thing that you've never experienced. You're like, and I'm not talking like the relationship you have to like your parents or like to a brother or like a really close friend. I'm talking like the ones who you're like, it's romantic. And like some of the guys in here were like, yep, I got to order flowers as well. We've been going out for 30 minutes and she's already asking. Like, I get you, right? Um, but I get that for some of you, it's brand new. Some of you, you haven't experienced it yet, and that's okay. For some of you, this is a thing that might be a little look. Like you've come out of one or you were in one and, and stuff happened and you're like, man, I am not proud of that. Like I made a lot of mistakes and I feel some shame. And, and I want to go ahead and get us out in front of the enemy and speak some words of life over you. That way you remember that when he brings up your past, it doesn't dictate your future. Okay? So, second, first Corinthians, not second. There's many Corinthians. First Corinthians 6, 9. Uh, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church who had a lot of relationship questions. And so he's, he's helping. And so here's what he starts off with. He says, or do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, people with bad mouths, nor swindlers, or people who steal, will inherit the kingdom of God. That's my favorite line, I think, in the Bible right now. It's my favorite line. And such were past tense, and such were some of you. Some of us are walking in, and it might not be something on that list, but you're walking in with stuff, and, you, and you're, you're feeling like that's your identity in this moment, but I'm telling you, such were some of you. Why? But you were washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Some of you tonight just need to remember that when you decided to commit your life to Jesus, that anything that came before that moment has been washed, you've been sanctified and set apart, and then you were justified before a righteous and holy God. And it's not anything that you do that gets you in that relationship, but it's all about Jesus' righteousness placed on to you. So when the enemy starts buzzing in your ear, as we go through this series, he's just going, Remember, remember when you were hanging out with her and you ignored the no? Remember when you didn't leave the door open? Remember when you were scrolling? And he's going to do it. And such were some of you. But you're forgiven. You're washed. You're sanctified. And you're justified. And I just want you to start out with that because I don't want the enemy getting in your ear and keeping you from hearing the love of God and, and the advice that God has for us. The second thing that I want to I say up top, it's easy 
to get into a place like this and hear guys like me and be like, well, he's married and, you know, he's a dad. So obviously, like, I'm just going to, like, tune him out. Be long before I was any of those things. Understand that I was a teenager not that long ago. I was only 16, 10 years ago. Okay, I remember 16 pretty well. Oh, was that a sneeze? Bless you. Um, but I sat in seats like you sat. And I faced the same challenges and temptations. I made the same dumb decisions in relationships. I looked at the same stupid things. And thank God for his grace and for redemption. I've been there. Okay? I've walked the journey. I'm not that much farther ahead of you. So when you listen to me tonight, listen to me as somebody who was once really broken and once really lost and made really stupid decisions. And it's just a little bit further down the path and by the grace of God has walked out of it and wants to help. That's the heartbeat. Not some dad getting up here and being like, yes, the one you need to like stop, you know? I'm not one of those, all right? So, all right, now that we got that, why are we talking about relationships? Aside from the fact that it's February and Valentine's Day and you should probably order chocolates and flowers for your people, right? Because you guys already are. You guys are already talking about relationships. You're talking about it in school, talking about the locker rooms, your social media is full of it. And they're constantly pushing images and topics and conversations into your feeds. And so your brains are constantly thinking on these things that revolve around relationships, that revolve around romance to an extent. And we make it a really big deal. In our culture, it's a huge deal to have somebody next to us. We make it part of our identity. And so I want to talk to you about it because if there's any place that should be safest to talk about these things, it should be in the church. God created it. And I kind of want to know if he created it, what he has intentions for with it for us. I didn't make it. We just get to be participants. So that's why we're going to talk about it in here. Another reason why we're going to talk about it is because there is an enemy who is seeking to destroy you. And he will lie to you in this area in order to hurt you. First Peter, Peter says this, he says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, this is like a wrestling or a boxing term. Somebody is literally opposing you. It's like if I were to get up in Nathan's grill, I'd be opposing him. That's what the enemy's doing right now. He's opposing you. He's your adversary. Some of us think that, like, we're like, okay, the, the devil is real, but he's kind of off. And, like, it's kind of like when we think about, like, ISIS or the Taliban. It's kind of just, it's out there. We know it's real, but it doesn't feel like it's impacting us directly. But that's not the case. The devil is specifically targeting areas in your life, and relationships are a huge one. So he says the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Other translations say to destroy Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being, suffer are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You see, the enemy likes a lonely Christian. The enemy likes just lonely people. In isolation, he can tear you down. And Peter says, hey, you can resist him. I wouldn't say it if it didn't mean it. You can. In your brotherhood, <clears throat> the people in your community, you do it together. You resist together. And so we're going to walk in this together. That's how you beat back the enemy, is you do it together. Don't let him get you by yourself. So the good news is you're not alone. There are other people in this room walking through the same stuff that you're walking through. Walking through the same stuff that I've walked through. Adults included. We're all human. We all make stupid mistakes. God has also called us to live holy lives. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says, For God has called us has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. So that the definition of purity is freedom from adulteration or contamination. A lot of us, I think, when we hear the word purity, feel like that's some kind of a restraint. Like our friends tell us we can't be free until we've crossed that line. Until we've, we've done something with somebody else. Or even just gotten into it, you just haven't, you haven't experienced freedom yet. It's not true. Freedom, purity says here, it's freedom from adulteration or contamination. Following God's plan leads to the ultimate freedom, a freedom filled with joy. So, to start tonight, to start this series, we're going to talk about something that many of you in this room are, socially. And if 
you're not, don't be a cynic, okay? I don't know. Um, singleness. We're going to talk about singleness. Yeah! yeah. Oh, I love it. I love some proud single people. Um, and uh, if you're like, I'm not single in here, what you talking about? My boo is great. Uh, we, uh, listen, you are legally all single, okay? Legally, on paper, you are not filing anybody as a dependent or as a partner. You're not collecting money off of them from the IRS. So you are all legally single. And that's what we're going to talk about. Because you see, there's this myth, especially in church, especially in Christian communities. Man, there's literally memes on memes on memes on memes of like people who go to like Bible college and they're not there to learn Bible. They're there. There, there it is. There you go. <clears throat> Ari's already looking at her Bible college options. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but no, it's real. We got people who are like the the whole thing they've heard from the church is not is not what can you do for Christ. It's all right. You gotta you gotta hold yourself pure and uh, you gotta maintain this thing and then you're gonna go to the school and then you'll get married. And like it's, it's always puffing up the idol of marriage. It's always saying that's the next level. And it's a myth, man. I grew up guilty of this. I grew up for so long, always wanted to be married. And in doing so, I wasted a season of singleness where God could really have used me more. I blew it. I could have just had a healthier version of it. I could have worked through my anxiety and depression way earlier than I did. It's a whole lot easier to walk through that when you're not trying to also handle somebody else's emotions in their life as well. I'm not saying they can't be there for you. But man, that's a lot harder. So... In this season, I'm talking about singleness, Paul's got a few words to say about this. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 says, and I want you to be free from anxieties. How many of us want to be free from some anxiety? I want freedom from that. The unmarried man, so the single person, is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Now, first of all, Paul's got like a really high standard. I don't think he knew like what was coming in 2020 something or other, right? So like we're all like, you know, I'm single, but like Xbox, bro, right? We just love Xbox. But his he's he's setting an idea for you. He's setting a goal for you, and it's not to beat NBA 2K with your best friend, right? Or to beat the newest Halo game or whatever. Um, but what he's saying is he's like, hey, if we're if we're truly about the things of God. If we're truly about the mission that Jesus set before us, like we talked about last week, people's actual lives for eternity at stake, and then he's assigned us this mission. He says, hey, singleness keeps us from distractions. He says, this is actually a good thing. It's not a curse. And, and Paul's not denying that it's just for a season. He's a, he talks more about this chapter about marriage, and you'll get there, and all that kind of stuff. But he's like, hey, if you're, if you're able to, while you're single, which many of you are, and it's good, I want to then challenge you. Use it. Use your singleness for something more. Use it for more than just doing your sports and keeping your grades up and then constantly hoping that Mr. Wright and Mrs. Wright's going to walk in your junior year of high school. Sorry. It's just... So singleness is not a restraint on our lives but it's a freedom to pursue God with everything. It's not a restraint. The restraint is the divided attention. Y'all have experienced this. I, I came in after Kevin. I love Kevin. Kevin's great. You guys got to experience Kevin at a lot of your events. Just be honest. He was there. I don't have that same freedom. And y'all met my wife and she's awesome. But notice, like, my interests, my attention, my ability has been divided. I can't be as committed. And I want to be. Man, I want to be there. But I do have other priorities. That's kind of what Paul's showing. And so I'm then asking you, you who are, your only responsibilities at the end of the day weekly are just to get through school with a C. 
Maybe a D. I think they started lowering some of the curves. COVID does things, okay? It does. What can you do in this season? How many of your friends would be sitting in this room if instead of focusing on that person who you haven't talked to, I've been there, all right? Had plenty of crushes in high school, never talked to a single one of them. Guilty of. Guilty of. All right? No game here. No game. No game, no shame. But how many of your friends would be sitting here? How many of your friends in school would see you praying instead of fretting over the text bubbles on the other side of your screen? There are 9,000 students in your community. And how many of you have let, A, the idea of being single be a curse and therefore distract you, or the idea there might be somebody out there as a distraction? And so you're more focused spending energy on that than you are growing in the way of God in growing in your relationship with Jesus. He's the ultimate relationship. His relationship offers you eternal life. Notice that Paul said, hey, I want to be free from anxieties. Then he's like, guess who's got anxiety? Relationship people. Jesus gives you freedom. He sets you free and provides a hope and it's for eternity. So how many people in your sphere of influence, would hear you talk about a Savior whose love is unconditional for them. Instead of you constantly going, I hope she likes me back. And I get it, because I've been there. Now, I want to talk briefly to those of you who are dating. And if you're not dating, then I really want you to hold on to this information and be like, okay, this is good. This is good advice. All right? First of all, don't stare at people who are dating. I saw that. Did you know the Bible does not have a category for dating? Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Ari. It's single or married. God sees it as single and married. Now, there is the whole, like, betrothed thing, like we saw, and that's the commitment to be married. That's the, like, what we call engagement, to be betrothed. Some of that's the ancient customs. Dating is a newer thing. This whole thing that we call, I'm talking to people, and we're going out, and I hope she likes McDonald's, because that'll be me. Well, now the minimum wage has gone up. Y'all can afford, like, chilies, right? Something like that. Chili. Chili. Hey, listen, they used to have that two for 20 or something. That's good. All right, all right. All that. Hey, listen, chilies is great. Um, so listen to me. You're single. I don't care what, you, what status you put on your relationship. Until you take vows and a covenant before God and with God, you are single. So let me say this and let me say it clearly. Singleness is not marriage. And don't look at me and go, no, no, when there are some of you in here who are acting like it is. Who have used that status to get you things that are reserved for marriage. And if you're in here, you're going, man, that was me. And such were some of you and you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified i've blown it too thank god for his grace but what dating is is it's an evaluation process dating is an evaluation process this means it's a tool to determine if somebody is going to be a good fit for the rest of your life not a perfect fit because humans aren't perfect, all right? We're full of brokenness. You're basically two sinful people who are trying to commit to each other for the rest of your lifetime before God. Good luck, all right? But it's a tool. It's a tool. It's an evaluation process. Um, I actually got a text from a student this morning, and he was asking a little bit about this. There's this thing we call it being equally yoked. And so I want to help a little bit with this conversation because, you see, Part of the evaluation process is picking somebody who's going to run in faith with you. And here's what I want to tell you is running at the same level. Your faith is going to struggle if you're constantly pulling somebody else up. Or at the same time, they're constantly dragging you around. Now, there are times of give and take. Listen, my wife is a prayer warrior. Myself, I'm a prayer warrior. Okay? Worry, warrior. Um, so there are times where I've looked at her and I'm like, man, I wish I had just an ounce of her prayer faith. 
But there are other times I've gotten to help her. And so we do this kind of balance of back and forth. But she's running on her own mission towards Jesus, and I'm running on my way towards Jesus. And so we're running at the same pace together. Not one of us is dragging the other towards Jesus. So there is being equally yoked a believer and unbeliever if you go and read that, that passage in, I think it's 2 Corinthians. But it's also more so if you are both believers getting into it, evaluate each other's faith levels. Evaluate those. That's important. So, a few things to evaluate. Number one, Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Do they humbly elevate you over themselves? Do they lift up your interests? Do they lift up the things that you're walking through? Do they say, hmm, you're more important? And mind you, this goes both ways. Now, I'm not saying this that you be a rug either. You're not a doormat. It's not honoring. Okay? But are they, are they looking to you more than themselves? Or are they being selfish in the relationship? This means that they listen when you say no. It means they honor the rules and guardrails you've set for yourself. If your parents set a curfew, then out of respect for you, they get out of the house. If it means letting a door open, they leave it open. They value you as a person, not look at you as a commodity to some end. That's elevating you over themselves. And that's whether it's physical or emotional. Because we will emotionally take advantage of people, especially in this generation and day and age. I am guilty of that. Thankfully, my wife was strong enough to be like, Justin, we've gone on a break. It's before we were married, okay? And I was like, yes, ma'am. I learned a lot in that season of break. I learned a lot from God, too. All right. Second thing, Romans 12, 10 says this. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So are you honoring one another? Jesus placed you first, so you place each other first. And you do it with honor. You honor their wishes. You honor their boundaries. You honor their guardrails. You honor their families. You honor them. And as of right now, as being two people who are in the evaluation process, doing married things is not honoring to one another. And manipulating, abusing, and shaming them to get your way is also not honoring. And being manipulated, abused, or shamed for holding to your morals and beliefs is not being honored. It's easy to get into these things and then the blinders go up and you tunnel vision. Fam, can I challenge you to be shrewd? Be looking for the red flags. Nobody's perfect. But be looking. Look for those areas. Because what you practice now is what you will continue in future relationships. And unfortunately, it's created some really unhealthy rhythms that our parents are finally waking up to and they're walking through. Your generation is one of the first generations to openly talk about mental health and emotional abuse and trauma, which means your parents experienced a lot of it. So in the season of your life, in the season that we call singleness, in the season some of us are like, man, I hate this, I, I feel lonely. First of all, you got a community sitting right here. Your identity and value should be placed in some specific one person. Get yourself a group of, of sisters and brothers who love Jesus and who can love on you and help encourage and push you. But in this season, be content in your singleness. It's a blessing. I wasted mine. I wasted it hardcore, man. I could have done so much more for the kingdom. You should date only to evaluate if that person is someone who can chase after Jesus alongside you. You see, when I was, when I was first in college, that's where I'm wrapping up. When I was first in college, I dated a girl. First girlfriend ever, okay? I've had three girlfriends. One of them is my wife, so you do the math. Um, I, got, I got there, and, and I, listen, I'm one of those, like, headlong, dives head first, full blinders on, ignores all the red flags, including my mom, and she's like, hmm, listen to your mamas. They know what's best. They're not trying to be jerks to you, okay? If you bring a girl over, first of all, it's a sign you trust your mama, then listen to her, all right? Or if you bring a guy, right? Same same concept. Listen to your mom. But uh, I ignored her, so I, I dated. I did, yeah. I gave it to the mamas. She was here last week. Um, and so I, I, I was dating this girl, and listen, this girl was on the was on the throne of my life. This girl was my idol. 
I was, I was preaching Jesus on Sundays, man. I was serving a middle school ministry. I had these sixth grade boys who I was responsible for and trying to help teach the gospel and, and teach healthy living principles and, and just how to like be good, decent sixth grade boys. It's kind of hard with sixth graders. Um, but I was trying. But then Monday through Saturday, worship at the pedestal of her feet. And I let things slide. I moved my guardrails and my boundaries. I lived a double-edged life. I lived divided, had anxiety, I messed it up. And thankfully, where there is failure, God's grace abounds. And thankfully, by the grace of God, we broke up. And I found healing. And then I stepped into a, sing a season of singleness. I literally had this prayer. I said, God, if I've got friends in my life, not even just girlfriends, like friends, who I would not want meeting the students that I serve and lead, get rid of them. I'm telling you, that breakup broke up a whole entire group of friends. And that sounds harsh, but what's cool about God is that he took away friends who were unhealthy for me. He took away friends who were challenging my morals, who were challenging God's principles. He started adding in friends who sharpened me. He started adding in friends who pushed me towards Jesus, who we would drive around for three hours in the car and talk about the grace of God and how he loves us and his forgiveness for us. We'd share about the stuff that we did. And it's in speaking that in the life that we found healing. And I want that for you guys. See, he is, bless you, he is the priority. And he is the relationship that will flow into the other ones that you have. So lean into that freedom this season. Strengthen your relationship with Jesus in this season. And if you choose to date, please just remember it is not marriage. Someday you may, many of you will, stand across from somebody. And it's a hard thing to stand in front of them. And the first words after I do are, will you please forgive me? Hopefully you've had the conversations prior leading up and you found, and the good news is if this, if this meant and it's, it's God willed and ordained and you both just Jesus, there's always forgiveness. Because Jesus first forgave and we model him. But I'm telling you, it's a hard thing to walk through. So honor each other. It's just an evaluation. And remember that at Jesus, if you accept Jesus, some of you have and some of you have not. But what I said earlier was true. In Jesus, you are washed. It means everything that you got on you that you think is your identity, and it's whispering into your ear. It's gone. It's washed. You are sanctified, so you're made holy. And you're justified. It means God looks at your account and says, It's paid. And it's paid to Jesus. Let me pray for you. And then we're, the band's going to come back up. And you guys go to small groups. Dear God, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for, uh, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the gospel. Um, thank you that you care about us enough to create relationships. But also thank you that you cared enough to, to give discernment to how to walk through them. God, in this season with these students... Pray that they understand they're more than just a youth group. That there's 9,000 students in their community that they're missionaries to. I pray that they, they would take this opportunity of singleness to, to limit all the distractions they can that we found chasing after someone else who ultimately is not you. It won't provide the same level of joy and peace. And I pray that they would just be on fire as a missionary in this area to those people sharing the gospel, bringing them here, that we would outgrow these walls and have to move into the other building. God, I pray that these students would be game changers. Because when you were here on earth, you didn't pick rabbis and scholars and 30-year-old Bible dudes. You picked teenagers just like these, who were smelly and stinky and cussed a little. But they followed you, and they listened, and they loved you, and then they changed the entire world. And I don't believe that power has stopped now. So I pray that your, your, your presence over these students, that they would go on to change the world, even just starting with the 9,000 here in this community. Jesus, name I pray. Amen.